Uh, welcome to y'all uh, into the green room this morning, and we're really pleased to have Drew Sullivan with Dickens Turf and Landscape Supply. And it's really uh, a great deal when you're in business to have friends that you consider uh, uh, like real partners, um, even though there's no there's no business connection between our two businesses other than the fact that we are uh, businesses, uh, independent businesses that uh, approach from the same standpoint and. Uh, uh, and I have yet to find anything where that really doesn't agree across the board. If, if you are a listener to uh, my radio program on Saturday mornings, and of course that is the At Home Show with Josh Carey and David Bates, the, uh, the uh, third member of our little group uh, unofficially is, uh, and or I should perhaps officially, is Drew Sullivan. Of course, Drew uh, is a, a frequent guest on the program, and he also... Uh, uh, fills in for, to co-host quite often where Josh or I want or not on the air, so we're always appreciative of that, and, and I always feel good about it because we know um, Drew's going to get information out there that's going to be beneficial to our listeners. Uh, so, without further ado, we're going to turn the program over to Drew Sullivan. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate all that David just said. We we uh, we have been friends in this industry for numerous years, uh, probably back in the 70s. Both of us being Nashville boys and kind of growing up in. I can remember I can remember going across the street and uh, cutting side with a little side cutter and rolling it, taking a half day to load it in the truck and another half day to get it laid. So yeah, you know, been coming to Bates Nursery for quite some time, but. Um, it, uh, going kind of back to my history, I uh, started in the landscape industry, worked with John Waller Landscape for probably, gosh, 20 years, 18, 20 years, and uh, went out on my own for a little, and then had the opportunity, was hired by Paul Dickens, Dickens, the guy that started Dickens Turf and Landscape Supply. He passed away about 11 years, another gentleman, years ago, another gentleman started the company, and uh, um, been rolling ever since. So. Uh, we just, we try to, we're a small independent, uh, one owner, kind of like David is, and we just try to have the best products for what will work, where when folks buy something from us, they'll come back and buy again. That's kind of the theory of our business, and, and we research things quite a bit before we do them, and always try to stay on the, on the up and up of what's going on. Talking today, let's have a joke first. Anybody, anybody want to tell <laughs> keep it loose. Dude, this, was, this was one that Paul Dickens used to love to tell. Older man and woman, they, they, were about, they were up in their 80s, lived a good life, and the man passed away. Died in the emergency room. Went to heaven, got to the Golden Gates, and St. Pete said, Sir, plugged in the DVD, watched the record of his life, and said, You've led a good life. I'm going to let you in. But he said, before you can come in, there's one thing you got to do. You got to spell a word for it. He said, well, what's that? He said, love. He said, L O V E, love. He said, you're in. But he said, hey, before you go on in, he said, uh, you got to use the restroom. Would you mind watching the gate for me here and just do the same thing I did if anybody comes out? See, he's smiling. Have you heard this before? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, he's standing there, minding the gate, and all of a sudden, boom, his wife of 60 years appears before him. And she says, honey, he says, well, what are you doing? He says, well, when you passed away in the emergency room, said I stepped outside, I was grieving, and I got hit by ambulance, and I, I died. And we're going to get to spend, we spent 60 years together on earth, and day one in eternity, we're going to be together forever, never going to be separated. And he said, honey, that's fantastic. He said, but there's one thing you've got to do before you can come in. You need to spell a word. And she said, okay, what's that? And he said, Czechoslovakia. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, sometimes things don't work out quite the way you want them to, but uh, we're, we're going to try to figure out how to uh, grow turf in Middle Tennessee. Oh, there you right. Hey, there's Oreo. Click on the yeah, right. Yeah, that's button. it, right there. That's probably why we're here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it, uh, as you can see, there's some good looking green grass in there, but dead spots, drainage, disease, who, who knows what it could be, but it, it, I know it's, it's always frustrating. You know, you spend money on side and what happens? Boom, it's gone. Yeah. You know, and you, you can tell they got a great landscape behind it. You don't know which way to turn. 
with signs, but you don't know what the sign means. You get disease. You don't know what to do. A little unfocused brown patch there. You don't know if it's brown patch, if it's summer decline, your grass is looking good. And then the signs, you don't know what to do. <laughs> I mean, you can't carry your dog, you can't bike, you can't swim, but hopefully we've got the answers for you. Because <laughs> if you're up the creek, we're going to get you there. We're going to figure it out. Because you can take this, you can take this, which that was a nice looking lawn. Well, whose look, house is that at, Drew? I don't know if you can see the front of that thing, but that probably that. gives it away. <laughs> That's what I was going to guess. But you can turn it into that. Wow. I wish I had a little bit better slides. But you, you can make that old turf look a little bit better. It, it can happen. But you got to have a plan. You, you've got to come up with a way to do it. And that, that first picture, I'm not going to dare try to go back. My backyard is always an experiment. And that was a house before the one I'm in now. And that first slide was of the heat tolerant bluegrass. I don't know if any of y'all have heard of the heat tolerant bluegrasses. That was going to be the greatest thing in the world. Well. They, they do okay, but that was what happens because my backyard, like I said, I don't water it, I fertilize, I take care of my soil, but I don't do anything else. I do not water, I let Mother Nature do it. It backed out. Now it did come back and fill in something. Anyway, there's several things you need to consider with your lawn. Um, there's several steps you need to do. You need to decide what species you'd like to grow. Um, soil testing is always good. If, if you listen to the radio, you hear us talk about that, and that's that's something we'll get into some, a little bit of detail in. But it's a in order to do with our soils, you, you need a soil test. And and the ones we run, we feel very fortunate to have had a guy by the name of Joel Simmons who uh, owns this company. We represent him and his products, and they do the soil testing, and it just it works, plain and simple. Dethatching area, some cultural things, overseeding, when to, how to, what to do, uh, even within the different species, your fertilization, how much fertilizer to put down, weed control and cultural lawn maintenance, what to do in certain ways and, and certain times. But that's some keys that, that we'll touch on today to see uh, how it works. Turf species selection. Do you want to grow fescue? Do you want to go Bermuda grass? Probably not, unless you're a, a golf fanatic and, and love it. Um, zoysia grass, how big is your lawn? Um, or bluegrass. Fescue, advantages and disadvantages, green year round. Um, mows, very pretty. Um, doesn't require a whole lot of fertilizer when compared to the other species. Not necessarily zoysia, but Bermuda grass and bluegrass. Um, it uh, can take traffic fair. Some disadvantages, uh, and it's probably not a disadvantage of the fescue, but it's a disadvantage of where we live. 90 degrees, like we were talking this summer. It's, it's going to suffer, plain and simple. We, we do all these, we get all these varieties that say uh, bread in the south for the south is one thing. It, it'll say heat and drought tolerant. Tolerant doesn't mean magic. It's, it's a cool season plant that it's going to struggle it's just where we live. But we can talk about some other things that we'll do to help that. Bermuda grass, um, which you listen to the radio, you know that's that's me. I'm, I'm all over it. That's what's in my lawn. I moved into this house four years ago. The front yard was predominantly uh, Bermuda, full sun from daylight to dark, one tree, 80% Bermuda there when I moved in. Why fight it? I was going to be fighting it. So What do you do if you get lemons? You make lemonade. Exactly. Exactly. Or you get a paddle. <laughs> <laughs> it's plain as that. Way. But, you know, it's just a decision. And, and yes, there are some disadvantages to it. It's evasive. But you, you come up with plans to to uh, to stop that. It's it's. Uh, I've built me a little tool uh, because out of my beds, I have a lot of landscape, live on a corner, got big curb areas. But I've got a swiper that I can pour a glass of flake in. It's got a sponge on the bottom, and I don't worry about spraying and getting drift. I just run that right along the edge. I do it about once a month, and my Bermuda stays at bay. So there, there are different things you can do. Zoysia grass, if if, uh, if I had small areas, uh, small lawn, that's what I'd have. There's no, or if I was starting new, there's no doubt in my mind, I, I would have zoysia. You've got to sod it. You, you can plug it. You can seed it, but it's a nightmare. So the you know a drawback to zoysia here again like Bermuda you're going to be dormant during the winter, but uh, 
pretty brown is nothing wrong with that. You know, you can mulch, mulch your beds uh, going into the season where it's going to be dormant and you've got a good contrast. Um, bluegrass, uh, viable option, probably not really. Blended with fescue, okay. If you've got some shaded areas, uh, dappled light, uh, we won't say grow grass in shade because it's not going to happen. But it, cooler in the heat is where it would probably do better. If you've got a, you go through these microclimates where you can just kind of feel the temperature go down. If you've got one of those areas in your lawn, your bluegrass is probably going to do okay. I, um, this past year I'm doing a huge garden in my back lawn area and I did a little pathway just from a patio to my shed, ran out of my budget, didn't have enough money to do the stonework, and I had some bluegrass in the truck and I just sowed it in there. It did fantastic. And I didn't do anything but put a pre-emergent on it. So now right now after 90 degrees, it looks kind of rough. It needs some work, but it'll survive. And your, your side companies around here, they do right. 95% of them do a mixture of fescue and bluegrass. They, they go together real well, but just, just decisions on what you want to do. Um, and, and please, questions while we go. I, I, I like to be very informal. I don't mind interruptions. Yes, ma'am. Well, you mentioned something about trees. If you do have trees, both high trees, like you say, dappled light mm -hmm. stuff, are you saying basically it's sort of hopeless for lawn? It, um, to, to have a lawn that you will be able to put in and forget about, yes, probably is. And, 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 and it, it so much gets into not just the, the type of grass you're growing, but it's the conditions you're trying to grow it in. Right. If you've got big trees, you've got big root system. Yeah. If, if you've got big root system and poor soil, you're probably not going to have a lot of grass growing there. Now, it's going to germinate. Mm -hmm. it, it's going to grow mm -hmm. in. But as soon as we get hot, when any conditions start backing up and getting against it, you're you're going to lose it. Traffic, mowing it, it's just it's going to it's going to be thin. It um, you, you almost Dr. Williams at University of Tennessee used to say, let Mother Nature give you your bed lines. You can kind of see where to to have shrub beds or ground cover beds and have it. But I mean, you see pictures all the time of nice grass under there. Uh, we'll talk about some blends later, but there's a. a the place where all the research is done on gold standard in Roseville, North Carolina, they've got a huge oak tree. That thing is a monster. Dense shade underneath it, and they've got grass that grows under it. It's called Aurora, uh, Aurora 2 Fescue. We started selling some of it and putting it in our shade blend, but they'll let it stay this high. Are you going to do that in your lawn? Really? You know, are they're gonna, they mow it maybe once every four to six weeks. Are you going to be willing to accept that? So. You start cutting it off and you start lowering the amount of roots you have. Right. So that, that's some different things to look at. Um, but really, questions anytime. I don't mind that. This is my good ear, so this is a great audience. I can hear you. <laughs> and if I don't respond, throw something at you. Um, soil testing. I, I mentioned earlier, uh, we, we were very fortunate to, to uh, be approached by Earthworks uh, Organic Fertilizer Company a few years ago. Uh, to, to, to sell their products uh, and have great luck. And with that comes Joel Expertise and another company he works for called First Soil Consulting. Um, and that's what we do all of our soil testing through. We send it off to a company up in Indiana called Logan Labs. And they, they give you, uh, I'll show you a printout of what they give you along with recommendations when you have your soil testing. Completely different than what you're looking at when the state of Tennessee does your soil test. Um, they're basically going to tell you what your pH is. They're going to tell you if your phosphorus and potassium are high, low, medium. They might say add this, add some slow release fertilizer, but they're not going to tell you why. They're, they're not going to tell you why your pH is low or high. They're going to say add lime. Well, there, there's different things you can do with this, like adding lime. If you're you check my notes because it's hard to remember all this. If your calcium is low and your magnesium is high, you would use what's called high cal lime. It's a calcium carbonate. But if it's opposite, if calcium is low and magnesium is low, you would use dolomitic lime. You, you don't get that from the state's test. Those guys do a great job. If it wasn't for those at the extension, we'd our, all our jobs would struggle. They do great research, is fine. But this is just, this is kind of an organically approach 
to to what you're doing to your soil. You're, you're essentially, you're thinking outside the box. We're not worried about plants with this soil test. We're worried about what's growing in it. You get it in line, and what's on top will survive and do good. You, it, it takes the concepts of using biological soil management, where you use organics. Um, there's, we've had customers that essentially, we'll talk a little bit about fertilizer, where you use four pounds of nitrogen per thousand a year on fescue. There's customers that are down to just a pound per thousand because they've got everything in line and they use organics. Now we'll talk about synthetics as opposed to organics a little bit when we talk to fertilizer, and it's a volume thing as opposed to a amount of nutrients. But uh, <coughs> what we do at the soil testing is you get what's called your base saturation in line, you blend organics with essential minerals, and everything just works. You just you get a you get a yearly, yearly plan. You can't really see this real well. And I wouldn't dare try to make it bigger, but on this, and if, if we'll send a thing around, if anybody, y'all want to send me your email address, I'll send you a copy of this PowerPoint where you can have it, or, or also, we do like David does a newsletter, where we will remind people what they need to be looking forward to doing each month, and we won't, we won't send it off anywhere, we got a great girl, Jessica, that does that, but they essentially tell you your, there's different things, you do get your pH, which this one happened to be 6.8, which that's fine. And his, uh, see his calcium was fine, the desired value, and they all change. There's, there's not a desired value that David's lawn would be and my lawn would be the same. It depends on how everything else lines up. You're looking at these calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, other bases, and your exchangeable hydrogen, which is your, that's your pH numbers. But um, it'll tell you what they found and what it was desired to. He was high. So on this case right here, if your calcium's high, you don't need lime. But his uh, magnesium was low, and it shows the deficit. His potassium was low. His sodium at 40 pounds per acre, that's kind of high. How do you get sodium? By using synthetic fertilizers, by rain coming down. It's just adding salts to your soil. What do salts do? They make soil tight. They'll burn out microorganisms. They make biology slow to happen. Problems. That, that's, your clay soil is not a problem. I mean, it is a problem, but that doesn't mean dig your lawn out and put new topsoil in there. That means get these nutrients in line, and your clay will, will get to where it'll drain better. It, it'll work when, when you're feeding with organics. Clay soil is just real, real fine. It, it's finer than sand. So that makes those particles stick together and things can't get in between. But you start doing these, getting your base saturation in line, and your soil will work. Magnesium being your, um, your, your green of your chlorophyll, for one thing. It's what makes, makes things green. So magnesium low, your turf might look great right when you fertilize it, but you lose that color in three or four weeks. It's not because your fertilizer's gone, it's because your plant can't take up magnesium. It's, 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 it's signs of the soil. Potassium, that stress and whatnot, Potassium is something you need, uh, it's very soluble in the soil. It'll work through the soil real quick, so when your potassium levels are low, and they say you need 10 pounds per thousand a year, which that's what these soil tests will say, but you don't do that all at one time. You'll add a little bit of, pow of potassium three or four times a year. I think that was through with that. Gypsum. That's one thing on, on my turf around Middle Tennessee. Do, do it every year. It's calcium sulfate, and, and you'll hear that gypsum is a, a clay buster. It's going to break up clay. The way that works, it flushes bicarbonates and salts through the soil. It will make them soluble where they'll essentially disappear. But every soil test, Joel Simmons recommends five pounds of gypsum three times a year. And it's just, it just helps everything work. Yes, Just by itself, not mixed in with some. Yes, exactly right. Can you just buy right. bags of gypsum? Mm -hmm. It's calcium sulfate. When you say five pounds, do you mean like five pounds per thousand square feet? Yes, sir. That's okay. why he says always. It. Calcium is used more in weight and volume than any other nutrient on the, what do we call that chemical chart? Periodic table. Yeah, yeah, on the periodic table. <laughs> You know, you always hear nitrogen, 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 phosphorus as a starter. But plants use more calcium than normally it's there, so you don't hear a lot of sit in the back. But it's used more in weight and volume than anything. 
Any questions on the soil test? Or? Yes, sir. When you do your soil test, do you do it in different parts of the lawn or just one? I mean, it's um, what we'll normally tell folks or, or we, we ask them is, is uh, the size of your lawn. Mm -hmm. if, if you're a half acre and everything does the same thing, one test would probably be enough. Now what you would want to do is like six different locations throughout your yard. You want to go down, for these tests you want to go six inches. Mm -hmm. Six inch depth, you can include thatch, grass, whatever, doesn't matter. But just mix those together and you know bring them to us or you know it would, it would be the way to do it. If you've got a part of your lawn that is completely opposite from another part, I'd probably do two different ones. But um, for, for a home lawn, I'd say once every three years. And if I've got it once and I've got my program and it's working, I, pro I probably wouldn't do it again. I'd probably just keep going with because the thing is you get those things lined up and, and yes, um, it's going to release and you're going to use up what's in the soil. But if you're using organics, and I don't care if they're mine or anybody's, I don't, I don't care what you use, they're going to feed the microorganisms in your soil. And those guys are going to go break down nutrients, they, they work symbiotically with, the, they're going to get sugars from the plant to survive and they're going to give nutrients to the plants. It's, it's kind of the biology of soil just in a nutshell. So if you can get those things working, your little bitty turf grass plants are, are going to survive. But that's a case, well, it could be some timing on your applications. Like if you do need to add calcium, uh, if, you, if, you're, if you're low and you need to add lime, lime is essentially a little rock. So you need that in your soil profile. It would work if you just broadcast it on the ground, but it, we always recommend aeration before you put lime down and then kind of sweep it in those holes because that way you get it down in your soil profile and it's going to start breaking down a little bit quicker. It's not doing you any good sitting on top. So finding out what to do when, and I even tell folks if you've pre-emerged and you need lime, go ahead and bust your barrier and put, get that lime in the, in the because it, it takes lime three years to break down. It'll take it three years to get where it's totally active in your soil. Mm -hmm. Now, there are other products you can buy. Uh, there, there's companies that make, uh, it's called Solucal, or one's called Accelerator, and they put an acid on the outside that makes it break down quicker. So there's ways to get it in there, but here again, it's not going to last as long. That's sustainability. When you get lime in there, another one's rock phosphate. If, you're, if your phosphorus levels are real, real low, if they're off the charts low, they'll advise using rock phosphate. That's another rock. But you put it in there and it's going to last long. So it, it's sustainable. That's what you're building a sustainable soil. So when you plug in the fall, that'd be the best time. Fantastic time, yes. Yeah. Okay. Not going to hurt. Yes, ma'am. When you send them for the test, how long does it take to get the results? Probably about two weeks. Two weeks. And, and it, it's different time of year. Uh, going into the spring, a lot, they get overwhelmed with golf course type tests. So it, it just it just takes them a while. They're a small lab. But this but time of year, would be this time of year we're looking at about two weeks right now, and it could get to where it, 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 it has been three, but right now they're about at two weeks. And roughly, what would you expect it to cost? It's about thirty-five dollars. Oh. Okay. If, if you if you come in, it, if it's rang up on our cash register, it says fifty, but. We, we look at it, we, we don't make any money on that. That's essentially what they charge us, but we're, we're thinking these folks, if they're just interested, they're going to come buy some stuff from us. Mm -hmm. So if you come in and I'm not there and somebody tells you different, you say, Drew said for it to be 35, and we're, that's one thing about being a little independent. They'll say, okay. Except <laughs> 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 my name's not Drew. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, yeah, it's very worth And we, we also give, and I, I should have made a copy of that, but we, when you get a soil test back from us, it'll have you a yearly plan on what to do monthly. And, and you give us your square footage, and we'll tell you how much you need to do. Now, if you don't give us a square footage, we're going to tell you in 10,000 square foot increments where you can, you know, change for a half acre, three quarters acre, whatever you've got. But, yeah, we give you a full printout, and, I mean, it just... It works. It's. I didn't, I didn't get. I should have put it on a slide. What What we've done on our fertilizers is we've got a starter for the basic starter fertilizer is a 182412. Everybody's used it for years. High phosphorus, just so you'll have a little bit of phosphorus when you put your grass seed plant out. Phosphorus prices shot out the roof five or six years ago. Just world economy. Uh, China started buying all the phosphorus. It's supply and demand. That's really what happened. But. Um, we got to looking into it. We blended, we blended phosphorus. With, we took half of it out of a ton, blended it with organics. Through research, we found that humates 
will help release what phosphorus is in the soil. Every year, no, but it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna naturally, as it says, reduce that thatch layer between your grass and what's above your soil. That, that's where a thatch layer is. Um, it could be leaves, it can be grass clippings the majority of the time, it can be dead grass, it can harbor insects, that's probably the worst thing it can do. It can keep moisture from getting down into your soil level, it can take keep nutrients from getting into your soil level, it can keep herbicides from getting into your soil level. If you've got a heavy thatch layer and you put your pre-emergent down, it might not, new ones will, will stop it because they'll kill a little bit better. But, there's, there's a lot of different things you can, that thatch can, can uh, deter. You can get less thatch culturally by mowing more often, or you can remove your clippings. Don't remove your clippings if you're not going to recycle them. We, we don't need those clippings in landfills. Re recycle them, use them, even if it's Bermuda grass. That's what I've got and I do it. I mean, till them in your garden, it'll work. But I'm, I don't know why, but I'm a green freak. <laughs> recycle. Um, aeration. Can't talk enough about aeration. I mean, I'm sure y'all hear us on the radio. Don't waste your money on grass seed if you're not going to aerate, or if you're not going to do something to that soil to increase your seed to soil contact. Um, core plug aerate, pull plugs. If you think about the theory behind aeration, if you've got a compacted soil and you just poke a hole in it, yes, you've got a hole, but you've got more compaction in the soil, not where that hole is. Pull something out of the ground. It, it's, it's, it's silly not to do it that way. And I mean, yeah, it can be, it can be an expensive or it's, it's, it's a little bit of labor to do. Uh, there's companies that'll come just aerate and let you do the rest of the, the process. Um, but um, we, we rent a few aerators. We're not in the rental business. And, and what you can do is get your, get your neighborhood. Heck, I mean, I think we charge $65 a day. Get it for a weekend, get 10 families. That's nothing. And I mean, to, to, you do a little walk behind the aerator, but aerate is just so important, not only for helping your seed to come up, but just for working that soil. Oxygen is the, is the one uh, element that nobody thinks about around a plant. Plants have to have oxygen. And when you start talking about our soils, you really need to get some down there to them. I will truly recommend to do uh, heavy aeration in the fall. Tear it up right now, make it look nasty. Then come back before you apply your first pre-emergent, say in March, just go over it again with an aerator and throw you a little bit more organics on it. Then, two, uh, we're getting now to where with all of our rains, we've had uh, in the spring where you really need to pre-emerge twice, but, uh, you know, aerate a little bit again, just, just go poke you some holes in there. Um, it's just, it, it's so important that you can see your thatch layer and that's exactly what it does. It gets oxygen down. You have shallow roots in compacted soils, you get your nutrients, you get your oxygen, you get your water, and you'll get a better root system to develop. It's just, it's no doubt about it. You're not necessarily looking to get the seed down in that hole. A, a lot of folks will think that's what you're doing because that's the one that will sprout first because that's where the water is. I like for you to, to aerate, put your seed down, and drag back over. Mow your lawn down, aerate, seed, take a mat and drag back over when you're renovating. And that not only gets a little bit of seed down there, but it fills those holes up with a good loose material and it gives you a good seed bed and it kind of gets that seed down in the soil. Just a piece of chain link fence, a, fence, uh, a pallet, railroad tie, a piece of carpet, just anything to kind of break it up. And, and while you've got a mess, while you've aerated, that, that's the time to do it. Just, it just adds so many things to, to help the the home of where your plant lives. Any questions there? <clears throat> Overseeding, choose your seed carefully. Another thing I forgot is, is about a seed tag. Know what's in that bag. Trust who you're buying seed from. It's, it is so important to, to that there's no excuse this day and time to, to buy poor quality seed. Um, there are some places um, I've got in here, don't buy, buy blends with annual rye. It'll, it'll have the prettiest bag, and it'll say Southeastern Mix, and you go, you go look at that, and it's got 20% annual rye in it. And you know, you're gonna be happy, because a week after you put that out, man, it's gonna be green, it's gonna look good, you're gonna think, yeah, 
but it's going to turn yellow. You're going to call me or you're going to call Dave. You're going to go, when I mean, you didn't buy it from us, but those stores where you buy that, they're not going to know what to tell you. So you're going to call us. You're like, man, my grass is looking good and it just started dying. And that it's annual ryegrass. There's, there, there's no reason to do it. Um, another, on, on, uh, on blends of grass, I mean, I guess this is the time to talk about uh, a little shade mix and whatnot, but if, if you do have shade, we, uh, let's see, I might even have some Yeah, this variety, that research is done. One of, one of the perks of my job is to get to go to some of these these farms. This is out in the Cor Corvallis, I believe I'm saying that right, yep. Valley out in Oregon. There. I mean, it's just, it's gorgeous country out there. But if you can see all those little white ribbons or whatnot in the ground, that's where they're doing individual varieties of, of different kind of grasses. And they, this, this one right here, I can remember from that day on this side of the pole where it's real low, those are actually bent grasses that they use on golf course greens. And that was a test for glyphosate ready bent grasses where they've got grasses you can spray Roundup over and it won't kill them. Monsanto doesn't own that by chance, do they? Uh, probably. <laughs> but um, they'll also, these varieties, you, you'll hear us talk about gold standard or whether there's actually new ones coming up. The, the, uh, right now in the market, there, there's nothing any better as gold standard. There's probably some as good as. But um, they're, they're all the time cross-pollinating. I mean, that, that's exactly what that is. They've probably got a, and honestly, I don't know if that's a fescue or a ryegrass. I would say it's one of the two. But what they'll do right there, they've got one that doesn't grow as tall. So they've got one you can kind of see a little bit of different color to them. So they'll put them in those little bins and let them pollinate back and forth. And then they'll take the new seed off and grow them and see if they can get a more compact, deeper green or one that's less susceptible to green, light, green uh, leaf spot on, on uh, ryegrass is bad about getting that. Brown patch and fescue use it. Might be that one of those growing in the field was just an excellent thing, didn't get any brown patch. But maybe it didn't yield a whole lot of seed. So it wasn't profitable for the farmer. So they'll cross pollinate. That, that goes on big time. And that's that's one reason this gold standard, you've heard us pitch that for years. It, uh, it's, it's, it's been great for us. Um, that, that's some other things they do right there. Talking about in the in the dappled light shade. They'll have now, okay, here they and I do have another, I don't know how to go back and forth, but you've seen this picture. That's under a lot of birches. That's actually in Oregon. That test right there is in North Carolina, where they put shade down. They make shade, and they see what grasses or what varieties do better in shade. And and we, we take some of that into consideration. Now, I don't know what time of year. that. Well, that's probably June when they normally have those things. So it's starting to get a little bit hot and dry. And they, like, they won't water those. They'll have parts of them. Some of those will be the same grasses you see in different things because what they'll do they'll have people come through and say without knowing what it is and say that one looks good or I like the color of this one and they'll mark it on their A1 or A2 and then they'll go back and look at the varieties um, and that's actually a field uh, that happens to be creeping red fescue has anybody ever seen that where they grow grass seed yeah. it, um, this this was when the seed first of June was actually pollinating and uh, I was hoping to be able to catch some of that on the picture, but you just see white clouds just poof, just go up in the middle of that field, just it, and it looked like it was fires, and that was that seed pollinating is how that worked. It's amazing the industrial scale on which they clean and process and package seed. I mean, yeah. you drive past these plants that look like they're a mile long. Oh my goodness, what are they making? What it's it's seed cleaning and uh, mm -hmm. production, so it's uh, it's pretty impressive. This, is this shot in uh, North Carolina or Oregon? That's Oregon.